All right, so we're very excited to be welcoming Booker Prize winning author Paul Lynch. He's the author of the novels Red Sky in Morning, The Black Snow, Grace, and Beyond the Sea. Grace won the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year in 2018 and was shortlisted for the Walter Scott Prize for Historical Fiction and the William Soroyan International Prize for Writing in 2018. In his lecture entitled The Dream That Wakes Us, Lynch said that we read fiction because the factual knowledge of the world casts only a small light and that fiction is necessary because it can accommodate the total strangeness that is life. And in Prophet Song, Lynch takes a torch to the world we often see in the news cycle and seeks to understand the domestic perils of a police state landing on our doorstep in a book that is terrifying yet beautiful. Lynch will be in conversation with Ron Charles. He taught American literature and critical theory before moving to DC and writes about books and publishing for the Washington Post and is a book critic for CBS Sunday Morning as well as receiving the, the Nona Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing. He was also a juror for the 2014 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. So please join me in welcoming Paul Lynch and Ron Charles. I have to say it's a real pleasure to be here with Ron because I was telling them backstage that I've been annoying some writer friends over in the States for some time. Why, 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 why won't Ron Charles review me? If I can just get him to review me, <laughs> everything will be right. Because I, I've, I've, he'll get me. Well, finally, the price was right, Paul. The <laughs> <laughs> moment I finished the book, I thought, I got to meet this guy. I have not been so upset, so disturbed, so haunted by a novel in many, many years. It is a remarkable piece of writing. This is a story about a modern-day family in a country slipping toward fascism. So my first question to you is, why did you steal our national story? <laughs> were, were, were there incidents in Ireland that led you to this story? You know, it's funny, about shortly after Prophet Song was, pu was published, there's a, a really great Irish journalist, Fintan O'Toole, many of you will probably know him, and he wrote an article for the, book, for, for, the, for, the, for the Guardian saying, you know, this book's just won the Booker and, and it's, it's, it's outlining a sort of right-wing thing and it's really brilliantly done, blah, 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 blah. But of course, Ireland has no right-wing. And then a few weeks later, the right-wing emerged in the riots. And, right. and um, I remember having a little titter about that because the truth is it's always there. But why did I steal your story? Well, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, I was in India last week, and they're tell and I'm getting the same thing. This is this is this their is our story. story. It's their story. Um, I met somebody from Palestine, and she said, You're, "You've told our story." And and this this is the wonder of fiction that it's possible to reach towards the universal. Um, somehow through through storytelling that, that, that I think the closer you get to myth, the more universal freight your 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 story can carry. And there was there, there was a line that was really important to me that I wanted to use in this book as an epigraph to our sort of tell the to telegraph to the reader what my intentions were. And it was a line from Cormac McCarthy's The Crossing, where he said, the task of the narrator uh, appears to be an easy one. It seems that he's required to choose his tale from among the many that are possible. But of course, that's not the case. The task is rather to make many of the one. Hmm. And we couldn't use it, we couldn't get permission because he, yeah. was, he, was, he was dying and, and the book was published really, you know, and very soon after. And, but but the, that was the goal that I realized that I was doing was that I was trying to create this container, this vessel, this story that could somehow hold within its grasp multiple, multiple narratives, timeless nar narratives, recurring narratives throughout, throughout history. And that's, um, that was my intention, but I, I'm not the best person to judge if I've succeeded, but um, it, seems, it, seems to have that, it seems to have that effect. As you say somewhere in the book, uh, the end of the world is always coming somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it is resonating now in countries all over the world. When we think of the great and terrifying dystop dystopic novels like 1984 and The Handmaid's Tale and The Road, things are already really bad on page one. Yeah. But that's not the way your book starts, no. right? It, 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 it slips so gradually into terror 
uh, as a reader, we participate with these characters like, like frogs in a pot as the water gets hotter and hotter. And I, I want you to speak how you imagined the arc of this plot as you sat down to, to write it. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much to talk about there. The realism is really important to locate the reader within a present moment that feels like the now. I mean, the book doesn't say whether it's set in a future Ireland or a counterfactual Ireland. Right. Some people are like, oh, it's set, set in the future. And I'm like, it doesn't say. You know, it's, maybe it's counterfactual. And, but what I wanted to do was to, was to create that feeling of, of just an, an unfolding reality through which the changes that occur become like the, you know, the pot of water that's gradually heating up to the extent that the characters don't see it, that Eilish is missing what's truly going on. Eilish is... Eilish is the central character, Eilish Stack. And because at, at, you know, at the start of the novel, we are in a liberal democracy. We are in, we are in the conditioning that we're all in now where you just assume that nothing's going to change. You just assume that this will continue forever. And so that's an aspect of denial, um, which is central to this book. And Eilish throughout is in denial about what's, what's unfolding. And she's, she's she, she is in a known world that's becoming an unknown world. And her husband is taken in for questioning and he's disappeared. And the country starts to uncouple, so to speak, from, from the known. And she's, she's consistently in denial about it um, because this refrain, well, it, 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 it can't happen here. It won't be allowed to happen right. here, is critical. Um, but I had this sort of lodestone, this thing that I was working towards. When I was early on, when I was writing the novel, I became aware of the last line of the book. Really? Yeah, I knew the very last line. And I knew that that last line... I had to prove it true. Mm -hmm. I won't say what it is, but that, but that for the for for Eilish to um, for Eilish to believe this last line to be true, mm -hmm. I would have to do a lot of work to make that true. And so the book took on this incredible, implacable, inevitable logic, whereby it I saw it as a series of equations working towards a proof, hmm. and this because of this, because of this, because of this. So this thing, this, this mechanism is just unfolding, unraveling, because the book is an unraveling. Right. And every time I would try to interfere with it as a novelist, oh, I'll have Eilish go over here and I'll have her do that, and maybe that's an that's a exciting idea, the book would just say no, no. And, I, and, and, it, and it, 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 kept me, it kept me along this very strict um, inevitability of, of what occurs. Um, I'm kind of rambling now, but they, no. And but so you had this plot drawn out. I knew it schematically. The characters yeah. didn't tell you what to do as they went along. No. Hear some people say that. Yeah, I mean, like the the thing the thing for Eilish, the thing that interests me, is this idea of being in the labyrinth. Mm -hmm. That you know, this idea of human blindness that we live our lives without truly knowing, you know, what's going to happen. We we we. Eilish is in, is, is, in, is in a world where she's constantly making choices, almost like a Greek heroine. You know, she, she's trying to outmaneuver this thing that's unraveling and, and, and is ranged against her in an enormous fashion, but she cannot truly understand or see what it is. And so the fates are almost aligning behind her. And it's a kind of form of blindness, and, and I'm really interested in this as a novelist. I'm interested in what we can't know and, and what it is that we can't articulate and how, how to demonstrate that in, in fiction. All my books have been doing it in one way or another. And in this book, I found a way to do it within a modern, a modern setting. Um, it's curious that we don't really know either. I mean... To go back to 1984 or The Handmaid's Tale, those books spend a lot of time telling us about the political context, the beliefs, yes. the horrors that are being outlined, the laws, even some of the politicians. Your book doesn't do any of that. Yes, for a very good reason. What is that reason? Yeah, so I'm, if, you take, if you take the Iliad, 
it foregrounds the heroics, it foregrounds the politics, the, character, the heroic characters. And it says nothing about the cost of, 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 of the Trojan War mm -hmm. on the ordinary citizen. And if you think about when we watch the news, to a certain extent, we're getting a version of that as well. And I'm really interested in the personal cost of events. Elish Stack, if you take the Iliad and you turn it inside out, you arrive at Elish Stack. Elish Stack is, 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 is what I'm chasing because I want to know how does this affect the individual at a personal level? Where were we? We were talking about the lack of overarching political d detail that lets us experience the novel yes. as yeah, Irish I mean, experiences. The, 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 thing, the thing about the dystopian, dystopian fiction is it very often has a message. Yes. It seems to want to, or to, to message to you a, a, an idea of, of, that the author wants, wants, wants you to know. And I'm, I'm interested in, in fiction that's fundamentally about grief, hmm. not grievance. Hmm. Because I think that when you're writing with a political message, then it's a grievance. You, you, you know the outcome. You, 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 know what it is. you know what the answer is. And I'm interested in grief, which is what we cannot know, what's lost. And so um, I'm chasing ancient themes. I'm chasing things that, that, that don't quite fit in with dystopian fiction. And so my, 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 my personal belief is like Prophet Song isn't a dystopian novel at all. Um, I think that the that the book is exploding the form somewhat because I knew when I was writing it that, that I knew when I was writing it that that that, that people would say, "Oh, this is a dystopian." Right. It's just my editor was like, "Oh, this is very dystopian," and I was like, well, "You know, keep reading." And um, but the thing is, is that very often dystopian fiction seems a little bit paper mache to me. Mm -hmm. You know that, that, that whereas I'm interested in deepening the real. And so the book has these long sentences. It has this feeling of the moment unfolding, so that we're, we're very often within moments of being, as Virginia Woolf called them. You know, these moments of just on just fluid reality, and that, to me, seems to be not possible for for a truly dystopian fiction. But also, I think that this book is in conversation with the past and the present and the future in a way that maybe dystopian fiction doesn't allow. And you mentioned earlier about, you know, this, the moment when Eilish, after Eilish has been through her ordeal, she's been through the unraveling, and she, she understands that the end of the world, as she's understood it growing up, is not some sudden apocalypse. It's not some global event. Right. That the end of the world is always recurring throughout time. That it comes to your city, it comes to your door, it takes your family, but for everybody else, it's an, it's an event on the news. It becomes folklore, it becomes myth. And so that's a conversation in the book between the past, the present, and the future that I don't think dystopian fiction would allow for. So, I mean, I mean, I just, I fight against such reductionism, you know. You've um, also said it's not a political novel, particularly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that it's problematic when writers are so decidedly political. And we've come through a period of time where fiction has been deeply, deeply, pointedly political. And there's, as a citizen, I can see the benefit of it. But as an artist, mm. I'm really deeply skeptical about it. I think that serious fiction has to meet a level of complexity about the world. And to do that, looking through one lens, looking through one, say, political lens, is just insufficient. Mm. I think that I think serious fiction needs to have as many lenses as it can, all of the lenses, mm. and so that's the goal. You know, you, there was a quote earlier. I, I said, you know, the, I think that life is fundamentally strange. I think it is fundamentally strange, and we're alienated, all of us, all of the time, and there, there's just so much complexity in the layers of the human being. And and so while I'm telling a story, I'm trying to get into all of these layers somehow. I'm trying to articulate the strangeness of it. And the, to, to be labeled, say for a book to be labeled as a political novel, it, it, I, think it, I think it does damage to that. I it does too. damage to, to, to the task. And, and there's a line I love from Stendhal, and he just says, you know, politics is the millstone around the neck of literature and drowns it in less than 15 minutes. Yeah. 
And yeah. And I think he's right. Yeah. If you, if you should just write an op-ed if you want to say exactly. something. Exactly. I mean, but like, like the idea that you would sit down to, 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 to from some to create a message. Right. It, it just seems, you know, in fiction, the framing of the questions is more important than the answers. And Prophet Song is a novel just full of questions. Okay. That's how I consider it. Mm -hmm. um, it's full of questions. And it even ends on a question. For any of you who read it, you will know that the, the very last thing that happens is fundamentally a question that, that, that turns back to the reader. And yet, at the same time, I'm aware that the book does have a political dimension that's inescapable. And that it does have moral weight that's inescapable. Um, you know, there's moral accounting in it. And, but that seems to me to be incidental to what my task was in, in the writing of the book. You seem like a relatively young man to be focused on grief. What, uh, what do you think makes that subject it's, so profound to you? Yeah, you know, I remember when I started writing my first novel, Red Sky in Morning, I was, in, I was 31, I think, when I started writing that book. And at that point, I thought, well, I'm just a normal 31-year-old. But the voice on the page was not a normal 31-year-old. That, that belonged to somebody else. Mm. And I started making a joke that the guy on the page was easily in his 70s. And I didn't know where that was coming from. And I suppose in many respects, I'm a tragedian. I think, I think the tragic worldview is, 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 what, is what I tune into when I write. And as a citizen, I'm... I'm an optimist. I get up, I wake up every day, and I go about my day as one can, and I try to see the best and everything. But when I write, there's an entirely different aspect of mind emerges. <laughs> this grumpy old man, this very sad, empathic, grumpy old man, and and you know, I I, in many ways, my project is to see life for what it is and to reframe it in a modern way, and I think this is something that seems old-fashioned, but actually isn't being done all that much anymore. And I borrow, or see myself sort of being the children of, of writers like Conrad, Faulkner, Wolf, uh, Melville, Dostoevsky, who, you know, I, 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 I coined a term recently to, just to try and articulate what it is I see in them, cosmic realism, because I think that they they manage to articulate what we are as if from the position of a cosmic eye. Mm -hmm. That, that they're, they're able to see what the human condition is. But meanwhile, they tell stories about human beings. And so you've got this enormous, you know, they're, they're, they're what Flannery O'Connor called realists of distances. They see us from the distance, but they see us close up. And I love that. And that's what I'm trying to do because the way that I conceive of my characters, the way that I conceive of my own life, is that we're in this silent world. We're in, we're in, we're in a implacable, inalienable, silent universe. Whether you have faith or not, it's silent. And I don't have faith. And so here we are, caught up in the white-hot moment of our lives, trying to create meaning for ourselves, trying to define who we are, trying to articulate and arrive at some sense of dignity for, 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 our, for our lives. But meanwhile, the world around us just moves implacably, silently. And, and these things cannot be, they're not, they cannot be aligned, really. You know, one does not belong to the other. And, but yet, that's the problem. And so all of my books, right from Red Sky and Morning, that, that's, that's the central project. And so that, that makes me to, in a certain kind of way, an old-fashioned writer, but actually, I don't think I don't think it's old-fashioned. I just think that's I think that these are universal truths. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think the human condition uh, needs to be rearticulated. Every every generation needs to needs to find a way to rearticulate it. Mm. Let's talk about Eilish. 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 I, well, I say Eilish because I come Eilish. from Donegal, but. Okay. Eilish is also okay. is also, and I actually caused a bit of a problem with with the audiobook because I was asked, <laughs> "Oh, will you record how you pronounce Eilish or Eilish?" And I just said, "Oh, he'll know. He'll know how to say it." So he chose Eilish. Uh, <laughs> so now I'm confusing everybody, ever since by saying Eilish. And like, no. it is one person though in the book. Yes, yeah. She's like us, right? I mean, she's well educated. She's a spouse. She's a mother. She, you know, she goes to work. Uh, 
Did the novel always come to you as her story, essentially? Or did you have to find her among that family of people? It's a good question. I, I, you know, before I wrote this book, for a couple of years, I had this, this, this vague idea that I wanted to write something like Budenbrooks, hmm. which is the kind of book that I could never write. You know, we've, I think as writers, you fantasize about the books that you cannot write. <laughs> and then, so I reread Budenbrooks and thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm really going to gear, ge gearing up in this direction. But when, when I actually started writing Prophet Song, Elish was there, and literally in the in the in the first. No, it was her story. To yeah, begin it was with. immediately she was there. She was hiding in in those opening sentences. But you knew she wasn't telling it herself. No, it's it's a very close third, um, is my style, and it's a way of getting right up. I've I've this way of getting right up alongside her, mm -hmm. while telling the story as a narrator. But but I, I I'm not I'm not interested in omniscience as a narrator. Mm -hmm. That that one of the things that I'm interested in articulating is telling the story in the third person, but in such a way that the narrator knows only as much as the character knows. And I think because this is how, this is actually how life is. Right. That, that we, we, are, we move through life moment by moment. And we, we constantly make decisions about what to do next, very often in a degree of certainty, but with no true understanding of the outcomes. And this style of writing allows me to, to articulate that, that, that point of view. Would you read a passage? And sure. I want to talk about your style. I'll read from the opening. The night has come, and she has not heard the knocking, standing at the window looking out onto the garden. How the dark gathers without sound the cherry trees. It gathers the last of the leaves, and the leaves do not resist the dark, but accept the dark in whisper. Tired now, the day almost behind her, all that still has to be done before bed, and the children settled in the living room, this feeling of rest for a moment by the glass. Watching the darkening garden and the wish to be at one with this darkness, to step outside and lie down with it, to lie with the fallen leaves and let the night pass over to wake then with the dawn and rise renewed with the morning come, but the knocking. She hears it pass into thought, the sharp, insistent rapping, each knock possessed so fully of the knocker she begins to frown. Then Bailey, too, is knocking on the glass door to the kitchen. He calls out to her, ma'am, pointing to the hallway without lifting his eyes from the screen. Eilish finds her body moving towards the hall with the baby in her arms. She opens the front door, and two men are standing before the porch glass, almost faceless in the dark. She turns on the porch light, and the men are known in an instant from how they are stood. The night-cold air suspiring, it seems, as she slides open the patio door. The suburban quiet, the rain falling almost unspoken onto St. Lawrence Street, upon the black car parked in front of the house, how the men seem to carry the feeling of the night. She watches them from within her own protective feeling. The young man on the left is asking if her husband is home, and there is something in the way he looks at her, the remote yet scrutinizing eyes that make it seem as though he is trying to seize hold of something within her. In a blink, she is sought up and down the street, seeing a lone walker with a dog under an umbrella, the willows nodding to the rain, the strobings of a large TV screen in the Zajic's house across the street. She checks herself then, almost laughing, this universal reflex of guilt when the police call to your door. Ben begins to squirm in her arms, and the older plainclothes man to her right is watching the child. His face seems to soften, and so she addresses herself to him. She knows he too is a father. Such things are always known. That other fellow is much too young, too neat and hard-boned. She begins to speak, aware of a sudden falter in her voice. He will be home soon. In an hour or so, would you like me to give him a ring? No, that will not be necessary, Mrs. Stack. When he comes home, could you tell him to call us at his earliest convenience? This is my card. Please call me Eilish. Is it something I can help you with? No. I'm afraid not, Mrs. Stack. This is a matter for your husband. The older plainclothes man is smiling fully at the child, and she watches for a moment the wrinkles about the mouth. It is a face put out by solemnity, 
the wrong face for the job. It is nothing to worry about, Mrs. Stack. Why should I be worried, Garda? Yes, indeed, Mrs. Stack. We don't want to be taking up any more of your time and aren't we damp enough this evening making calls. It will be hard work getting ourselves dry by the heater in the car. She slides the patio door closed, holding the card in her hand, watching the two men return to the car. Watching the car move up the street, it breaks for the junction and its taillights intensify, taking the look of two eyes that gleam. She looks once more onto the street, returned to an evening's quiet, the heat from the hall as she steps inside and shuts the front door, and then she stands a moment examining the card and finds she has been holding her breath. This feeling now that something has come into the house, she wants to put the baby down. She wants to stand and think, seeing how it stood with the two men and came into the hallway of its own accord, something formless yet felt. She can sense it skulking alongside her as she steps through the living room past the children. Molly is holding the remote control over Bailey's head, his hands flapping in the air. He turns towards her with a pleading look. Ma'am, tell her to put my show back on. Elish closes the kitchen door and places the child in the rocker, begins to clear from the table her laptop and diary, but stops and closes her eyes. This feeling that came into the house has followed. She looks to her phone and picks it up, her hand hesitating. She sends Larry a message, finds herself again by the window watching outside. The darkening garden not to be wished upon now for something of that darkness has come into the house. Jesus. Oh my God. I think I'm on Washington, Washington time now, though, just, just you know. <laughs> why, why didn't you do the audio book? <laughs> that was fantastic. I can't do voices, that's my problem. <laughs> I, I can't do the inflections right. You probably noticed. Oh, I thought you were fantastic. My God, you, you know, when you... When you read books for a living, which is a great privilege, I know, but when you open a book and you, you come upon an opening page like that, you know, it just feels like a blessing. It's just an amazing event in your, in your life. Um, One of the things that I, why I enjoy reading, actually, is, is, is that for those of you who haven't yet read the book, now you'll have the sound of my voice in <laughs> yes. your ear. And it's like when you hear Heaney read his poems. You never forget that. The, the particular inflections and intonations that he uses, that when you, when you, even when he's not there and you're reading it, you, he's, he's there as a presence. So I'm now inside your head. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It's Eilish's denial that uh, protects her family for a long time and then puts them in mortal danger. It just made me so sympathetic in a way I never had been before when I think about people in the innumerable tragedies of the 20th century. And you ask yourself, well, why didn't they run? Why didn't they leave? It was so obvious. It wasn't obvious. It wasn't obvious to them yeah. at the time. Yeah, that's, that's a huge question that's been asked in this book. Because I agree, we all do it. We watch, we watch the historical documentaries and we say, oh, I would have I yes. got out. I would have known. I would have read the signs. Right. And as a, as a novelist, I say, I ask, really? Would you? Well, let's see just how complex this is. And so the complexity for Elish is that she's a mother in her 40s with a, a career. She works for a pharmaceuticals company. She's got three teenagers, each with particular needs that need to be addressed. She's got an infant child. She's got her father, who's very slowly succumbing to dementia. And her husband has been disappeared. So that's a lot of complexity just right there. Right. And her, Simon, her father, has these moments of lucidity where he says to her, Elish, you need to get out. <laughs> and and she, she's just, she's like, but Molly, Molly's in the hockey team and they're going right. to gonna win the league. And Mark's doing his leaving cert, which is, you know, the main school exam. Right. You know, and... and, and and Anya in, 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 in Canada, who's her sister, is saying, you need to get out. Get out. And, you know, Anya's sister, history is a silent record of those who did not know when to leave. And Elise responds, that's very well for you to say. But, like, 
I'm here dealing with all this, and Larry's not, Larry's not here, and I can't go till Larry comes back. And meanwhile, what if Dad falls and breaks a hip? What then? And so we see how imprisoned she is. But also, it's not just an imprisonment, it's, it's identity. Because we are all these multiple versions of ourselves. You know, we are our career. We are our position within our families. We are siblings, we are spouses, we are, we are uh, sons and daughters. We also belong to place. We inhabit place very deeply. It's particularly if you've lived somewhere all your life. Right. It's, it's, you know, that's, you're conditioned into that. And so what I've learned writing this book is that for somebody to make that decision to leave in the way that we've been watching on the news, people taking those boats across the Mediterranean, that all of these aspects of your life, all of these identities that make you you, they're all unplugged one by one by one until there's nothing left. And that's when you leave. But that's also when you become a non-person. Okay. That's when you become a thing. And we watch the things on the news, and we judge them as things. And it seemed to me that there were a number of writers who had taken on the boat question at the point of the boat and afterwards. But I wanted in this book to actually explore it multiple steps back. How do you become that? How do you, what makes a person take the boat in right. the first place? What is the level of unraveling and complexity that's involved? Um, and that was that was a big part of what I wanted to do. It's right there in the opening, right? I mean, the police are there. The beginning has begun, yeah. and the kids are arguing about what's on TV. Yeah, yeah, that's the fluid reality. It's 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 it's, the, it's that it's that sense of the real that I'm chasing. And there's very often long sentences in the book, and the long sentences do two things. One is that they they help to articulate that that feeling of 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 the now, just this sense of what the real is, and I think that the, I think the job of fiction is somehow to seize hold of reality, in some way, some manner, and get it on at the page in as much complexity as you can. Because you know, life is not black and white; it's gray, it's high resolution gray, and 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 that's that's the goal for me as a writer. And so these long sentences are trying to trying to do this. They're trying to press into the moment. Mm -hmm. They're trying to sort of mimetically mirror what's going on. They press into feeling, they press into action, they press into sensuality, they press into into everything. And at the same time, there's this undertow in the book. There's this very, very powerful pull. And the long sentences help to articulate that. This sense of that something is unfolding and it has her within its grasp. It's like she's been lifted off her feet by a riptide. Which is the feeling of reading the book. Yeah. I and mean, the sentences aren't just long. I mean, Hawthorne writes long sentences, yeah, so does yeah. James, but yeah. those aren't your sentences. Your sentences don't let up. Yeah. They are yeah. propulsive. They pull us through this book. And there are no paragraph breaks either. There's yeah. nothing to cling on to. Yeah. You just, I mean, when she says she's breathless, yeah. we're breathless there, reading this. There's no white space because there's right. no room to breathe. Right. The, the, the claustrophobia has to be articulated by the form of the novel. Is that a style you developed for this book? It's a style that the book told me it had it, that oh. had to be so. That when you when you start writing a novel, you, you 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 look for a form that can articulate the meaning of the story somehow. So all those decisions you make, sentence length, rhythm, music, style, all all of these particular aspects have to associate back to the meaning of the text. So sometimes I, I've seen some writers make remodernist decisions, trying to bring back some form of modernism for reasons that don't seem to be of anything to do with the meaning of the book. And right. so that to me is, is, is actually a form of pretentiousness. If, if it doesn't, every decision you make has to, has to go back to the meaning. And so when I was trying to find the form of the book, it told me what was necessary. Mm. And so I, I just listened. That's the thing is you listen to what the book wants and it sets out for you its particular formal rules. Kind of and and so there are no paragraph marks, and I mean, gosh, there's so many writers who've written without paragraphs. You know, that's Sarah Mago is, is a, one of my favorite writers. But every writer who does it does it for a different reason. And um, this book, 
it, it, it just it kept speaking to me about what was required, and it was very insistent. It was very strict. And, and I was like, okay, I respect the rules. I'll, I'll write it this way. A grammar of dread. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's one of the interesting things is I, about that sort of dread. I'm really interested in, in that old idea of the sublime. You know, that feeling of our awe or terror in the face of, you know, nature as, as, as it was for the romantics. And I think that modern life has so bamboozled us and atomized us that our ability to experience that feeling of awe or terror in the face of what this is mm -hmm. has been lost. And so I'm always looking for ways to rearticulate the sublime in my fiction. Beyond the Sea, my previous book, was hugely concerned with that, with that problem of how to re-address re that. And in Prophet Song, the same thing again. And I think that when Eilish cannot truly see what it is she's up against, therein lies our terror. Hmm. I've talked about how upsetting it was to read the book. Was it upsetting to write the book? Did you read it over and were you unnerved by it? I mean, you had to live with it for years. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you feel it, <laughs> for you to feel it, I have to feel it too. And that's the truth of it. That's a lot to live with for years. I it, live with it for a week. Yeah, sorry about that, Ron. Uh, um, sorry to you too. Um, um, but an interesting thing happened to me in the writing of the book that there's, you know, I take very seriously what this book asks of the reader. And it asks a lot. And But I also take very seriously my own job as a novelist. And I think that, I think that it's lethal for me to avert my gaze, mm. to look away. I think, I think that's for the truth-telling that's required in this tale. If I was to look away at the crucial moments, it would fatally undermine the novel. And so I knew that I would have to go into the eighth and ninth circles of hell. And I thought of, I thought of how Virgil accompanied Dante. And so I thought about how I need to accompany the reader and, 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 and offer them some poetry and some grace. Because if you're going to ask the reader to stare at the Medusa, or you're going to ask them to look into the abyss, you have to hold their hand so they don't fall in too. And chapter eight, which is a book where the abyss looms in a very, very dangerous way, I knew that I had to do something that was dangerous for me too. And I wrestled with it for months, and I, I felt very blocked. I didn't quite know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it in such a way that could take the reader with me, but also respect the reader. I didn't even know if I should do it to a certain extent, to what, how, how far I needed to go. And so I, I, I wrestled with it for about three months where I just wasn't writing at all. And then I had a dream, and I wrote an essay about this. I had a dream, and the dream showed me really clearly the coordinates of how to do it. Honestly? Or yeah. is this like a Kublai Khan no, makeup no, no, story? No, 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 I, 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 I You know... I'll talk about the subconscious in a minute because I'm fascinated by it. Um, but the dream showed me how to do it. And I jumped in the car. It was during COVID. So Ireland was under a lot of very, very... We were one of the most locked down countries in the world and you couldn't leave a five kilometer radius from your home. And I was given the use of a, a house in Roscommon and I jumped in the car and I drove to Roscommon, which is a two hour drive repeating to myself the kind of things that Eilish would say to herself while living in a police state. Because if you were stopping the roads by the guards, the guardie, you, you, would, you would have to explain why you were. Uh, and so I found myself in this ironic uh, position of, you know, having written sections of the book long before COVID that were about a police state. Suddenly I'm in this, you know, a country with emergency powers and a police state. And I was all for it because I, I ended up having long COVID too. So, you know, it was necessary. And I know my father would have died without it. And... Um, but it was just it was it was it was it was very it was very strange and I got to this house and that chapter came out in five days and I'm a very slow reader I'm a 200 words a day guy and it just it was there it'd been building in my head for months and it just um, but this thing about the dream I'm a meditator and I've been meditating seriously for maybe 16 years something like that and one of the things that meditation does is it trains you and teaches you to watch your own mind. You learn to watch your creativity. 
and you start to get glimpses, very, very, very dark glimpses of the door into the dark that is your subconscious. And you see the images that come to you that need to be unpacked, that need to be explored artistically. And you learn to catch them. And this, this aspect of mind I'm, I'm profoundly interested in because I think we all have it. We, no, I don't even think we do all have it. But it's, it's an aspect of mind, and I, I'm not being mystic, I'm being psychological, because psychologists are really interested in this stuff now. And I spoke to a psychologist about it just last night. There's an aspect of mind that seems to operate outside of language. And perhaps it's older than language. And it's, it speaks in images, and it speaks in dreams, and it's where symbolic truth occurs. And this is what writers have been chasing, and artists have been chasing, and mystics, and... And, and it's where the good stuff comes from. And when you learn to live alongside it and live in a state of receptivity, you can catch, you can catch these things when, when, when they come to you, but you have to respect it. And, and my feeling is that life now, we're, we have been so, just we're so bombarded by modern life that it becomes really impossible to access this part of ourselves. And because this is also where your most authentic self resides, it's it's the inner wisdom. Um, that's that, that's my observation of it. And I, I, as I say, I'm not I'm not trying to be mystic about it. I actually think it's just a genuine aspect of mind. And, and I see all these different religious traditions, um, meditation traditions, artists, all talking about the same thing. They just come at it from different angles, but it's always there. So now you know how strange I am. The title, Prophet Song, seems to look ahead, seems to be a Jeremiah, particularly after you've read the book, if you consider what we're doing now. Do you think of the novel as having some prophetic power, or is that, am I reading the title all wrong? It can be read that way. I think that a good book, I hope it's a good book, allows for multiple readings, you know. Um, I do think that for many of us in various parts of around the world, many of us living in liberal democracies, we're living in a dangerous moment. I think many people, it's been a few years since I've been to the States, but in the few days that I'm here, I'm picking up an energy from people that's very, very different to when I was last here. And I think that this sense of of, of the moment if you join the dots to the opening of Prophet Song, you can understand what, how, how, how do you get from here to there? And so if a reader wants to ask themselves that question, well, what's the outcome if we get to there? Well, the outcome is Prophet Song. Because I think that there's a failure of imagination after a, period of, after a point in time among the generations. You know, lived experience falls away, living memory falls away. And then alternative ideas start to become exciting again, in a way that there's a you know, I, I read recently that a lot of it was a, an incredible number of young people polled were inclined towards authoritarianism because they'd never had it, they 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 they'd never encountered it, and so on on one hand, this book maybe is 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 meeting a failure of imagination and it's saying, well. If that's what you're interested in, let's look at the outcome, the inevitability of what will occur. Because, you know, we mentioned earlier about not articulating the politics in the book. That's a very decided thing, because if I'd articulated the politics, then the book would be about that politics. Right. And I'd be, you'd be locked into that. And instead, I'm locked into the outcome, because the outcome is what's universal. And so there is a, there is a, a nightmare logic to the unraveling. And it's the same in every country, in anywhere that it occurs. And the outcome upon the individual is always the same. And so I'm interested in, 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 in the problem of dignity, you know, and, and how, how, how do people maintain their essential dignity in the face of, of things like this? Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, so a book like this can, it can work like that. But ultimately, as well, it is looking at the patterns of history, and it's 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 articulating that view that that the end of the world 
is actually recurring over and over and over again. That it's always happening. It's not, it might not be in your town, but it's happening on the news over there. And, and if you live in Gaza right now, for example, or you live in the Ukraine, or anywhere where there's been a destruction of any kind, for the people at the, at, at the, at the receiving end of that destruction, that's for them is the end of the world. That's, that's what it looks like. Right. Many people here want to talk to you too. You take some questions from the crowd? Of course. Yeah. There's a mic here. Yeah, raise your hand and I'll bring the mic. And the if mic you would please not give away uh, essential details to the plot or the ending of the book, we'd all appreciate that. I've uh, never been in the presence of a Booker Prize winner, so I'm going to take advantage. Um, so tell us, what was it like to, to win the Booker? Um, when did you know that you were probably going to do it? Uh, just tell, talk a little bit about what it's like. Well, first of all, you don't know. And the, the pressure in the room is metamorphic. <laughs> right? it's, it's incredible, because every writer there knows that when you win it, there's life before and there's life after. And life after is profoundly different for the writer who wins it. And, you know, I, I, I'm not a mainstream writer. I don't play it down the center of the court. I play it to the edges always. And so it seems strange to me that, that, that I could possibly win this prize because this prize is the center of the court in many, in many respects. Um, having won it, I realized that I've brought the center of the culture to me, that I'm now the center of the culture somehow, which is very amusing and strange and... But it's, it, it's, it's very surreal. It took me a while to, to, to truly process it. And um, I was sitting in a car, um, in my car in the area of Dublin where I live, which is not, nothing fancy. And I was stopped at traffic lights, and I just got back to Dublin. And I was trying to process it because, it's, you know, like you've just won the biggest book prize in the English language. Um, it's a global prize. Like on the Monday, the next day after winning it, there was 3,000 media pieces around the world with my name in it. Uh, that's, that's, that's kind of insane. I did 23 interviews the next day, t television, radio, and press, and then it kept going. And, I just, and I, it's, it's, it's very difficult to process it. And I was sitting in the car, and I just thought, I know that Paul Lynch has won the Booker Prize. I it is a great book. And I know that I'm Paul Lynch, but... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I've won the Booker Prize. Um, and it's, it's settled in now. It's settled in, but yeah. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Hello, excellent novel. Um, I wanted to uh, read a quick sentence that, uh, that you wrote when Eilish is talking to Carol. And she says, you must continue to believe there cannot be despair where there is doubt, and where there is doubt, there is hope. And I'm just curious about your own thought process in faith in writing this book and in perhaps the solace that might come from maybe a man of the cloth or something that is or is not in the book. Anything you wouldn't like to talk about that? Well, Elish is deeply motivated by hope. I think that if, if, if she was to truly allow herself to, to meet the truth, of what's unfolding, then it would all fall apart. Her family would fall apart. The efforts that she's going to to direct the family out of this would, would collapse. And it gets her denial gets to such a point. And the denial is aligned to hope that, you know, there's a conversation later in the book where Carol, her friend, suggests to her that, well, even the dogs on the street know what's happened to our husbands. And Elish shuts the conversation down and walks away because she needs to hope. And despair is, despair is the, the cul-de-sac of hope, unfortunately. That's, that's where it ends, and she, can't, she cannot be in the cul-de-sac. It's just, there's, there's just too much at stake. Um, and when you have children, you understand that, you know, as a parent. It's like what you will just, you will, you will go to the end of the earth for your kids. That's how I think of it. Right back here. Hello. Um, we recently just read the book, my friends and I. We were huge fans. We actually ran here as soon as we found out that you were appearing today. So thank you for being here today. Um, my second, my main question is, uh, having read the book, is we and I were very fascinated with the fact that you chose, you know, Ireland, a real country, 
there are a lot of elements of realism in the book, as you mentioned, speaking of the news, speaking of the BBC. How did you come to that conclusion to pick a real country where you're from rather than perhaps, you know, sort of a fictional country? I'm just very interested in how you very much grounded that in reality. And of course, a Western country versus, you know, places that we typically understand are war-torn in the 21st century? That's, that's a great question. You know, when I was writing the book early on, or before I was writing the book, I was thinking about the problem of Syria quite a lot. And it was in my thoughts, just as a citizen, about what had happened. Because that was, you know, we, we witnessed the complete collapse of a modern state and an outpouring of millions of refugees. And there was this sort of complete confusion, or not confusion, indifference, and, and a lack of imagination about what was truly going on there. And I think that, that was it was filtering into the work. But I, I, I understood that, for example, if I was to set a work in Syria, if I, if I was just to do that, then it would be about Syria, which wasn't, you know, that's, I couldn't tell that story anyhow. It would be beyond my powers, and uh, you know, culturally, and, and at every level, I, I couldn't do that. But it, it showed me something, that there is a universal aspect to it, and that once I moved to Ireland, I was creating a simulation. And when you bring people into that simulation, you're bringing people in through their own eyes, their own, the way they understand their world. And that's how I, that's the trick, is, is, is by making it, by setting it in, in an Ireland that, that, that I know, the same supermarkets that I go to, and the same school runs, and, and, and the Dublin that is suburban Dublin. That's just a world that, that all, so many of us know. And it seems to be impossibly removed from what I describe in the book. And so, for me, the, the conceit is the simulation. By, by simulating it, it actually shows you not just what's possible, but it also creates the possibility of genuine empathy. Not sympathy, but actual f empathy. You feel this for yourself. And if I had said it in, some, in a different kind of way, perhaps the, the door would have closed for some readers. They would have gone, they, it, it would have remained closed. But by literally bringing it into the locus of, of the world that is known, then that changes the, 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 the way the book hurts. It hurts you in, in a different kind of way. I hope that answers that. Hi, um, I'm from the same book club. <laughs> uh, uh, but my question was, um, your story for uh, for us, or for many of us from diaspora communities, is very, very real. Um, I couldn't help but think of Palestine and Syria when I was reading this. And um, one thing that I was curious about is um, uh, you explore the way living in a police state or occupation or war impacts people. Um, and it was interesting how it impacted one family in very different ways, um, from uh, Ailish to Mark to Bailey to Molly. Um, I'm curious how you decided how this conflict would change these characters and the trajectory of their lives and how they struggled or grappled with it. In particular, I thought the juxtaposition of Ailish and Mark was interesting. Her her denial, her wanting her like struggle with accepting, but Mark's very like clear vision for himself and the role he would play in this war without giving away spoilers. Yeah. I mean, it was it was really really important for me to, in creating Elisha's world, this known world, this this just this world that I almost live in, that to have as the book progresses, this the, the nature of 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 of, the, of what she's enmeshed in the political, it just starts to infect the family unit, and as the book progresses, that infection gets deeper and deeper and deeper until it's a disease. And, and one of the things I was interested in, in doing that was to really map the outcomes of such an infection, such a, you know, these traumas that are visited, map them on the different, to see how different people respond, because there's three teenagers. And you mentioned Mark, and he's the oldest child, and he's, he becomes radicalized by what's going on. The radicalization seems inevitable, because he's watched his father disappear, and so it makes sense that he would start to align towards... The op opposite, the opposite side. That's that, that's the next generation becoming radicalized. Her daughter Molly starts to become depressed and, and and grows inward and stops playing hockey and and 
you know, she starts spiraling inwards. And then there's a relationship with Bailey, her 12-year-old son, and when, her, when the father disappears, she, she chooses not to tell him the truth. And that's a really dangerous thing to do to a child because there's already such an absence of truth in the world around them that by her becoming part of that, he then, she then alienates herself from him. And that sets in motion this particular dynamic between them. And so there's also the infant. And there's a moment in, in, in the story where, I, I'm, I'm not giving too much away, but I am, but there's a bombardment, you know, and she, they're in the house. And she starts to think about how she's transmitting her terror, her anxiety into the child, that the child is absorbing this terror. And the child will store this in, in his body. And he will grow up and he will carry this inside him. And it will emerge later on. And he won't know fully what it is, what the source of it was, why he's acting out or whatever he's doing. But this is what's, what's going on. And so the, the nature of, of what's unfolding of the tyranny actually transmits into the psychology of the characters and, 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 and grows tighter and tighter as the book progresses. And that's, that's what I was doing. So you weren't the only person from Ireland that was there at that Booker uh, stage. Uh, there was also the bee sting and you know, the other Paul. Old time. There was actually two other Pauls. <laughs> and, and Paul Harding, right. And so, um, and, and of course, there have been many or several Irish winners over the past few years. And so I'm, I'm just wondering, when you talk about um, the intensity in that room, is there some intensity within Ireland that's producing <laughs> this type of work um, year after year? There's a factory in the Midlands. Uh, <laughs> you've got a, if you, there's a little code here in the back of my neck. Um, I'm still glad you asked, because I always wonder, are we just not getting the bad Irish novels? Do they not make it across? Maybe it's the rain. I don't know. We get a lot of rain. I mean, you're sitting indoors looking out the window and, you know. I, I don't know what it is. I really don't know what it is. But uh, it was, I, I know Paul Murray very well. And um, when we were long listed together and then short listed, we would meet up frequently, whispering to each other, what the, what's going on? <laughs> how are we going to get through this? Because we knew how mad it was. And, and it, was really, it was really lovely to, to have somebody actually going through the tunnel with you to, to, to sort of relate it and, and who could understand it for themselves. Um, and we, we had a lot of fun along the way. It was, it was a really lovely experience. Sweet to hear. That's a tremendous novel, yeah. The Beast Sting. He doesn't speak to me anymore, though, of course. <laughs> we have time for this one last question before the signing. Hello. I um, have a very practical question. I'm writing my big first book for two years now, and I feel that it's a wrong book. In one of your interviews, you said that you were at the half of writing a wrong book. How did you decide that it was a wrong book and you tossed it away and started the new book, The Prophet Song? How do you decide? So, this has happened to me a few times. Yeah, 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 I know. That, I that I've the, been... I read the interview. Yeah, well, I'll tell the audience about it. Yes, I read... Because they don't I know. I read the interview, yeah. you said so. so. Several wrong books. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's just part... Writing is failing. All of writing is failure, and sometimes you fail better, and sometimes you, sometimes you have a sense that maybe uh, I'm actually going in the right direction. But I was working on, on, on a novel that was so, so god-awful that if at any point I ever sell my literary estate, that will just disappear quietly. Nobody will know about it. <laughs> and it wasn't even, you know, all of my books, if, if you read my fiction all the way through, they're all Paul Lynch novels. This was not a Paul Lynch novel. It was something that I was having to get out of my system. But I was banging at it for six months and like hitting granite rock and just getting nowhere. And I think the important thing, you know, the great Irish writer Colm Tobin said, finish everything you start. And I say, actually, don't. No, sometimes know when to quit. And there's a reason why you got to know when to quit. It's that a really great story or the story that's going to do it for you is going to be this vehicle. It's going to be a vessel that you can launch into the sea. And it's going to be a story that will move like a story, but it will also at the same time carry all your obsessions in that vessel. 
And sometimes when the story, what you're trying to write isn't working, it's because those, are, those things are not aligned. There's, there's a misalignment between what you're chasing and what you're, what you're telling. But when, when the alignment comes, it just takes on its own momentum. It, 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 something beautiful happens, and so that's what I look for. And when I was, when I was um, writing that wrong book, I stopped writing it. At, it was a Friday afternoon. I remember. I remember it really, really well. And I just said, "Okay, I own up now. This is the wrong damn novel, and I'm going to stop." But I also accept that nothing is ever wasted in fiction when you're writing. Nothing you ever write so is a waste of time, and I. I said to myself, I will come back on Monday morning and I will create a new page and I will, I will, I will just start to write. Uh, but I had this sense, I was talking about that door into the dark, this sense of, of the subconscious speaking to you. I could hear something, I could feel something, I knew there was something there, I just didn't know what it was. But I trusted, I trusted the intuition as it was coming, that I would be okay. And I turned up on Monday morning without any idea what I was at. And I wrote the first page of this book, very, 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 very close to how you read it now. And it's all there. The meaning's in the first sentence of the book. The first few sentences, the entire meaning of the book's encoded there in the language symbolically. And I didn't know what I was doing, but some other part of me did. And I just think that's the beauty and mystery of writing. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much for being here today. <laughs> really, really enjoyed it.